everyone, and thank you so much for joining me here today on the Mindful Mustelid podcast. We will be discussing loads of topics on the podcast. While I create ferret content on my platforms, I will be delving into the pet food industry, biologically appropriate diets for carnivores, medical advances with ferrets, and so much more. In today's episode, I will be going on a bit of a rant. I have received so many messages the past few weeks from people wondering why their ferrets behave the way they do. Why do they shred pee pads in the cage, dump food bowls, chew on blankets, bite their siblings? Generally, it boils down to the same thing. Not enough free roam time. So many ferrets all over the world suffer from depression because we keep them locked away for 20 hours in the day or even more. The American Ferret Association only recommends a minimum of four hours of free roam time. This is not nearly enough. You will see me say six to eight and more, but discussing with other ferret owners, we've agreed that even six hours is not enough for most ferrets. And the reason for that is because ferrets are not caged pets. They don't belong in a box. They need constant access to a space where they can run, stretch their legs, a place to be a ferret, to be an animal. I hear many claims, well, I let them out and all they do is sleep, and there's a reason for that. Ferrets sleep a lot on and off throughout the day, and when locked in a cage, what do you think they will be spending their time doing? Sleeping. They will sleep until they are let out. Unfortunately, many ferrets, even when let out, will continue to sleep. These ferrets are so depressed, they know that in a few short hours they will be locked up again for another 20 hours and the cycle repeats. And it's a very, very sad and slow cycle for a ferret. Ferrets are very intelligent animals. You hear me saying that all the time on my channel. They need enrichment and time to explore. In the last episode, we discussed how the ferrets drive for exploration is so extreme. They need it. They need it to thrive and to be happy and healthy. I know it's not always appropriate to put ourselves in an animal's shoes as we don't really know what they're thinking, but imagine if you were locked up in a small area with no room to run, left only with food, a blanket, and a box to poop in. For 20 hours, sometimes even more, every single day of your entire life, seven years, eight years, however long the ferret lives, that is how long they have to endure. It's a prison. You're in prison. As I mentioned before, we don't always know what an animal is thinking and how they're feeling, but it's quite clear that locking such an intelligent animal away for extended periods of time is not proper care. It's borderline animal cruelty. In many cases, it is exactly that. I sound angry, and that's because I am. No matter how many times I say they need to be out of the cage, people don't listen to me. No matter how many blog posts I make or videos I create, and they come to me wondering why their ferret ate their bed or why they squeeze through the bars to escape, why they lost a tooth biting on the cage, why they're trying to destroy everything in sight. Another thing, ferrets cannot be happy limited to just one room in the house. Exceptions for abnormally large rooms, of course, but just normal bedroom sizes is not enough. I learned this the hard way. Before moving out, I kept my crew in my bedroom. They were constantly trying to escape, so much so that Patsu had a blockage scare from shredding my carpet near the door. I knew that something had to change, but I chose the wrong route. I created a playpen around the door so he wouldn't scratch the carpet, and that wasn't enough. I I even allowed them access to the hole upstairs, which was better, but still not enough for them. It wasn't until I moved out and gave them full access to my one-bedroom apartment, then it was enough. They don't try to escape, they don't try to destroy or fight me, they are happy here. It's not always realistic to expect people to open their entire house up for their ferrets, and I totally understand that. I just ask that people try to expand on the allowed space for their ferrets, ferret-proof a second room, and let them explore it. Switch up the items in that room so each day they go in, it's a different experience for them. Get a playpen and section off unsafe areas when they're out playing. It won't be the same as full home access, but it will help your issues. Almost every person who has asked me what to do in this situation, and they've taken my advice and applied it, they come back to me to say that their ferrets stopped chewing blankets or they stopped trying to bite as much. It has always been a positive outcome for the people who choose to make the change. Never has anyone come back to me and said that it didn't work, and I think that says something. Trying to feel content with the fact that I can't make everyone change. Not everyone shares the same standard of pet care that I believe should be a requirement. Anyone is able to walk into a Petco and walk out with a baby ferret. I 
can't expect everyone to want to care for them properly and that's just the sad reality of it something that I've had to come to terms with and one of the most difficult things that I've had to understand throughout this whole process of being a ferret educator if you are listening to this and believe what I say may apply to you, I urge you to please listen to me. I hear it all the time that, oh, but I work full time or I go to school all day. Then make it work. You've got a very high maintenance exotic animal that requires life outside of a cage, plain and simple. If I was able to make it work, you can. If you are absolutely unable to let them out of the cage for a proper amount of time, you should consider rehoming them. And I wanted to add a note in that since... Practically everyone is out of school now because of the virus. People are out of work. This is a perfect time for you to practice proper free roam time, ferret-proof larger areas of the house, and so on. Right now is the perfect time to be doing that. And the whole rehoming thing may sound cruel, but it really isn't. Keeping a pet and refusing to rehome when you are not providing adequate care is cruel. There are people out there, some of which I've spoken with, that believe no matter what, you should never rehome your pets. This is so harmful and such a selfish way of viewing things. If you move to an area where owning ferrets is illegal, I will always say to rehome them for their safety. If you cannot afford a medical procedure your pet truly needs, rehome them. Unfortunately, the people saying it's irresponsible is why so many choose to dump their pets outside rather than bringing them to a shelter and being responsible. Rehoming to a shelter has such a negative stigma. Am I saying that you should get any pet you want and not feel bad if you get bored and want to give them up? Absolutely not. I am saying that if you fall on hard times and it affects your pet's care, rehoming is a responsible option. And free roam time is a factor in that. There are people who only allow two to three hours out of the cage for their ferrets, and that is just not acceptable. And a lot of these people are home a lot of the day, and they just choose to only let their ferrets out two to three hours, but they're home, and they're there, and they're able to do it, and that's just the saddest thing ever. If you're listening and you want to transition your ferrets to a more cage-free lifestyle, I have a video and a few blog posts, lots of resources on this subject to help you out. Moving on, as you all know, I am an avid promoter of raw diets for ferrets, cats, and dogs. Pet nutrition is my thing. I love researching it, talking about it, learning about it, sharing my experience. One of the biggest problems with raw is it's entirely up to the owner to do it properly, and that can be a large responsibility for some people. They don't want to do the proper research or buy pre-balanced raw diets. They want to do the cheapest route possible with little planning required. There are people out there who read one article article on the benefits of a raw diet and immediately run to the store, buy a couple chicken breasts, go home and feed that and only that. I mostly see this problem with dog owners, probably because I've been working in the industry for many years now, and it's more of a popular topic in that community. I've seen so many improper raw and home-cooked diets, it's insane. I feel comfortable talking about this publicly because I no longer work there, but just to name a few examples, we had a Jack Russell Terrier who would board with us and she was fed a diet strictly of cooked chicken, rice, and sweet potato. That's it. This dog was suffering so much on the inside and deficient in a countless amount of vitamins and minerals, and no one said anything. We had another terrier-type dog who, for breakfast, would only eat a few pieces of chicken jerky and then just cook chicken at night. And you could say that maybe when they go home, they're fed a more balanced diet, but with us, which would be like for weeks at a time, we would be feeding this every single day, and that, without a doubt, has an effect on the animal. We had a cat that was fed cooked chicken in water morning and night and nothing else. This was apparently recommended to them by their vet to get the cat to lose weight. We had one pair of cats that was fed a proper pre-balanced grind, but then per vet recommendation for whatever reason, the owner took it upon herself to add one half cup pumpkin to one of the cat's meals to aid in digestion, which I don't necessarily agree with. So just goes to show that, I mean, even... In all my years working in the pet care industry, I have not once found, I mean, you don't see too many people feeding raw, but in the ones that I did, I do not believe that any of them were actually doing it correctly. 
with raw there are so many ways people can get it wrong and here's just a basic list of some of the ways that that can happen the first one people who unknowingly purchase pre-made raw diets that are lacking in sufficient organ meat or other animal products this is a subject that isn't super talked about in the raw feeding community a lot of people who feed raw actually ignore this and willingly and knowingly go out and buy pre-made raw diets that are not balanced for whatever reason and are continuing to recommend these brands which i don't know why uh, the second one people feed raw diets containing a high amount of vegetables and fruits over animal products this goes for all animals ferrets dogs and cats um, the next one, when doing a DIY Frank and Prey plan, not correctly following the percentages. Uh, number four, overfeeding things like liver, salmon oil, and eggs, not feeding any red meat, not feeding a variety, and not properly cleaning up after prepping raw food, and so on. Let me discuss each of these separately so I can tell you why I put them in the list. So for the first one, people who unknowingly purchase pre-made raw diets that are lacking in sufficient organ meat or other animal products, this is very common. I see this a lot with brands like Stella and Chewy's, which you've probably heard of, Primal, Darwin's, and more. Many of these companies sell pre-made raw for cats that can be fed to ferrets too, and are missing things like heart meat, organs, proper bone. Some contain loads of synthetic vitamins and minerals to make up for that lack of animal product. For example, let's Let's look at Darwin's cat meals, and this is in no way trying to throw Darwin's under the bus. This is just a fact. This is what they've chosen to do, and I'm going to talk about it because, I mean, again, this is what they chose to, this is how they chose to make their product. So, and I think it's worth talking about because it's not a balanced product. Um, it's not balanced in the way that raw should be balanced, I should say. Uh, so the animal products it contains is meat, necks, gizzards, livers, and hearts. The missing link being adequate secreting organs. It contains only liver as the organ when balanced raw diets should contain other secreting organs along with the liver. A diet made up of only liver for organ amounts would not be a balanced product in raw feeding. So they make up for it by adding in synthetic vitamins and minerals to help balance it out instead of actually adding the proper organs, which I will not ever understand why. I would think that it would be cheaper for them to add the actual proper animal products into it so they don't have to add those synthetic additives. Uh, maybe they do it because they just they don't feel confident in having a product with the proper organs and not adding something extra, which is odd to me because there are many companies that do it successfully and do it right. So I feel like there is no excuse um, as to why they would wouldn't want to put that proper organ in. Anyways, in their organ meats explanation on their website, they only discuss hearts, which are considered a muscle meat, not an organ in raw feeding, and liver, and that's it. They don't talk about any other secreting organs for some reason. Primal Food, their grinds are marketed for cats and dogs. Their raw frozen grind chicken formula, for example, only contains meat, neck, gizzards, and liver. I'm not sure this is right, but judging on the ingredient list, this grind doesn't even contain hearts, along with other secreting organs. It doesn't even contain added vitamins or minerals to make up for that lack of animal product or any added taurine. This grind would be very dangerous to feed cats in particular, who require taurine and cannot synthesize it naturally like dogs can. These things are not specified on the brand labels. It doesn't say anything about adding taurine or hearts, not that I've seen on their product packaging. These products are sold as balanced products and consumers won't think twice to question them because, I mean, it's a raw grind by a raw company. Why would they sell you something that isn't safe, right? I mean, that makes sense. Unfortunately, that's just the way that it is. So let's quickly look at a properly balanced raw grind. Raw Feeding Miami's Chicken Grind. It contains meat, bone, heart, liver, and kidney. Finally, a perfectly balanced product. For an absolute ideal balance, whole prey grinds are great because they include every single secreting organ and body part of the animal. You can find whole prey grinds on My Pet Carnivore. If you're wondering why so many companies skimp out on ingredients, I honestly couldn't tell you why. I'd like to think that they're trying to save money, but I'd imagine, again, it would be cheaper to just include the actual proper organ meat and animal product rather than adding the synthetics in, but that's just, you know, my personal opinion. I'm not a formulator. I don't know how much money um, the organs would be to add into a food over synthetics. 
All right, the next one. People feed raw diets containing a high amount of vegetables and fruit over animal products. This is obviously more of a dog-specific issue. We can't healthily feed vegetables or fruits to our obligate carnivores like cats and ferrets, but man, do people really go overboard with this one. There are two DIY raw diets dog owners follow, the first one being Prey Model, which is what we use for ferrets and cats, and then the Barf Diet, which includes vegetables, fruits, and seeds. On a Barf Diet, dogs should only be getting 7% vegetables, 2% seeds, and 1% fruit. It's very minimal. Some dogs get a little more than the recommended guidelines and are fine because all dogs have different needs and are built differently. But from what I've seen on social media, people are really taking advantage of this by a large margin. I see bowls with a small amount of ground beef like at the bottom and then the rest a plethora of colorful vegetables, fruits, and seeds and supplement powders on top to make a rainbow bowl of food. While this looks pretty, it can't be super beneficial for dogs. The bulk of the diet should always be animal products. While they do receive a lot of vitamins and nutrients from vegetables, fruits, and seeds, the bulk of what they need is just from their meat and their organs and the bone that they should be getting. Next one, when doing a DIY Frank and Prey plan, not correctly following the percentages. For some reason, this is a huge problem and I don't understand why, because to me, I learn very easily just by looking at, you know, this needs to be this much, this needs to be this much. For some reason, that's really hard for people to understand and I, I can't wrap my head around it. For some odd reason, people look at the recommended NRC guidelines for raw diets and go, I'm just gonna go do whatever I want and then seriously harm their pets. Most often I see not enough bone and meat being fed. Getting ferrets to eat bones can be hard, so many people skimp out when they get to that part of the transition and rely heavily on calcium supplements and eggshell powder to make up for that calcium. The proper thing to do is get them onto bones and save those powders for emergencies. And this has been sort of an issue with some of my students in my raw mentoring program. Um, some people like to go at their own pace and others like to do it as quickly as possible, which is always what I recommend um, to get them on this fresh, uh, healthy diet as soon as possible. But some people do take their time and that can be detrimental to their ferrets because if they're on the soup stage, which is where everyone starts while switching to raw, usually, um, if they're on that stage for too long, they can get a lot of loose poop, some diarrhea, loose stools, um, because they're just, they're not getting real calcium. They're getting it from the powdered eggshell or the calcium powder and it's just not the same as real bone and it's not in the same amounts necessarily. Um, so I always try to rush this part of the process because because, I mean, again, they just can have problems if they're on this soup for so long and the, I, I guess you could say, synthetic calcium supplements. Uh, some also totally skip over organ meats for some reason or feed the wrong things for organs. Many people think chicken gizzards and lungs are organ meat when they are both considered muscle meats. This may seem like such a minute issue, but it really isn't. A ferret can seriously be deficient in so many things when not fed organ meat. It's not even funny. If you are genuinely genuinely confused on what you should be feeding, follow this guideline. Write it down. Remember it. This is your Bible. 70% muscle meat, 10% heart meat, also considered muscle meat, but given its own category because it's a necessary part, 10% edible bone and meat, 5% liver, and 5% other secreting organs. Now, this is just a guideline to follow. Some ferrets benefit from less meat and more bone and so on. Please message me if you're having trouble formulating a plan for your ferret. Next, we have overfeeding things like liver, salmon oil, and eggs. This is very, very big <laughs> right now, especially with the salmon oil and the eggs. I just made a blog post on salmon oil and how often it gets overfed. You can read it on my blog, but these are all things that are commonly overfed. This is a huge issue. Liver, fish oil, and eggs all contain fat-soluble vitamins, meaning the excess from what they need gets stored in the body and not removed, leading to vitamin toxicity, which can be fatal. Salmon oil should be fed no more than one teaspoon per ferret spread out over the course of the week. Eggs should be limited to one to two in the week per ferret. If you're feeding whole eggs, I would recommend only one egg per ferret. Sometimes I even just do one egg for two ferrets. So for my four, I only feed two eggs total in the week. I think that's better because um, if you're feeding both the white and the yolk, it can be a lot. But if you're feeding only the yolk, you can get away with doing one to two in the week per ferret. And for liver, we must follow the 5% total liver content in the diet. 
People go over the recommended amount for liver by feeding only liver for the organ percentage, feeding liver treats, or even feeding cod liver oil. This can lead to vitamin A toxicity. We should strictly follow the 5% liver content that is more than enough for ferrets, so going over is dangerous. Next, we have not feeding any red meat or a variety. This is a big one, and the red meat goes along with not feeding enough variety. Feeding a diet of only chicken is not nutritious enough. You must feed at least one red meat source. I recommend more than one, and it has to be a primary protein in the diet, so if your only red meat source is beef kidney and nothing else, I wouldn't count that as a staple protein in your meal plan. There are myths that come with feeding red meat. People say it's not healthy or that it's full of parasites, and maybe for humans, eating a diet primarily of red meat wouldn't be as healthy as lean proteins, but for animals, it's different. And the myth that pork is full of parasites is totally bogus. This only really affects wild boar meat, which you probably wouldn't be feeding anyway. Wild boar is completely separate from domestic pigs, which is what we feed the normal pork. And uh, not feeding enough variety. Variety is key in a raw diet. Your pet will not thrive on a diet solely of chicken or beef or duck. There has to be not only a variety of protein sources, but a variety of the ingredients that you use. For proteins, it's recommended to use at least three, but more is always better. I regularly feed things like chicken, duck, turkey, beef, pork, fish, mussels, and more. When you have this variety, they will get nutrients that are more readily available in other proteins. For example, fish is high in omega-3 fatty acids when commercially farmed meat is high in omega-6s. You want a balance of the two, so the fish will help even out that balance. For ingredients, I recommend mixing up your bone and meats. Feed a mix of wings, legs, necks. For meat, feed different cuts organs, toss up the secreting organs, feed, one week feed pancreas and thymus, and the next feed brain and kidney. Liver and heart meat can be fed from multiple animal sources as well. This also keeps things interesting for your ferret, and the more that you introduce to them, the more likely they are to accept new things. A lot of ferrets can get really stubborn even when on raw, and will only accept chicken products or turkey products, so it's good to keep switching things up so they don't uh, rely heavily on one protein. And the last one is not properly cleaning up after preparing raw food. The preparation stage is the highest chance you'll get of actually contracting salmonella, so it's crucial to practice safe handling, prep the food as if you would for yourself, wash and sanitize immediately after using, you know, utensils or cutting boards, whatever you use that touch the raw meat, and always wash your ferret's bowls after they eat. Ferrets can also shed salmonella in their poop, so cleaning up after them properly is also important. If you are practicing safe handling, the likelihood of you or your family contracting salmonella is very slim to none. Now that I've finished discussing the main topics of this podcast, we move on to pet-related news. I'm slightly late on this topic, but the company Milkbone was under fire recently due to their recent marketing method. They were posting multiple ads, putting down other species to promote the opinion that dogs make the best pets. They created one for ferrets that said, have you ever smelled a ferret? Life is better with a dog or life is more fun with a dog, something along those lines, and the small animal community went absolutely mad. I personally did not appreciate this ad scheme because Milkbone is such a big company and they are directly fueling that stereotype that ferrets make bad companions with this scheme. So far, I do not think that they have come out with a statement or an apology. Their usual response was, while we're a bit biased as dog people, we certainly did not intend to offend or place preference on a particular pet over another. We know that all pets are special and well-loved, and we will be sure to share your thoughts with our team which doesn't really make any sense because they're admitting that they are biased, but then they didn't intend to place preference over them. That doesn't really make sense to me. That wording just doesn't make sense in my head. Although the company creates low tier treats for dogs at best, and I would never personally buy them, I don't think that this is that awful of a situation, but it is frustrating to see ferrets shown in a negative light as they are always like that in the media. In truth, a ferret's odor can be greatly managed by feeding a proper diet, providing adequate living conditions. I do believe they should have made a public apology because they offended many members of the small animal community. Many of them have dogs, not just ferrets. And now we all have this bad taste in our mouths over this company, and we probably would not recommend this product to anyone else because of it. And that, to me, 
is a negative reaction and probably not something that they wanted. Lastly, I wanted to discuss briefly the COVID-19 craziness and our recent rescue mission to New York City. By now, you will know that we drove down there to pick up a single ferret so that his mom could return to her home country. And this is something that I really want to do when we get a house someday, actually have some sort of foster and rescue operation, small scale, of course, because my heart can only handle so much and that business is very emotional. We've had success fostering in the past and it was a lot of fun. Being able to enjoy the company of other ferrets before helping them find a forever home is so rewarding. I highly recommend doing that. Maybe not doing it the way that I am, where I'm taking full responsibility and so on. I would work with a shelter and actually, you know, foster through them. This ferret does require a dental surgery, which I just posted a video about, so please do check that out. I'm still waiting on a phone call from the vet for the actual finalized estimate of the procedure. It will be available for adoption once he recovers from that. As far as the virus goes, I didn't want to talk about it too much because I see this everywhere and I'm sure, although it is devastating, you are all sick of hearing it and need a distraction. I briefly wanted to say that I sent out a newsletter to all current and graduated students from my mentoring program, and so if you didn't get one, please do let me know. And if other raw feeders would like to take a look too, please message me with your email. Kibble feeders, you shouldn't have too much of an issue finding food during this time, as I believe pet stores will stay open, but I can't say there won't be any issues or delays with online deliveries, so do stock up now. I am a bit nervous about finding meat for my ferrets, in all honesty. I've heard people are hoarding even the non-perishable items, which is just super sad, by the way. I, I only get what I need and that's it. I don't have the room or money to buy in bulk all in one time. Thankfully, we do have enough toilet paper to last us a while. I had got it all right before this all went down. I had no idea. Um, but I just hope that you are all staying safe. Remember to wash your hands and limit travel. It will all be okay eventually. And to finish off the episode, I will be going back on live possibly tomorrow, so stay tuned for that. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram and subscribe to my YouTube for more content. Thank you guys and have a great rest of your day.